Welcome back to another week at Cheney Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Daniel, and I'm joined with the senior pastor, Dr. Keith Peters. Uh, so last week, of course, you continued your discussion on how God sees us, uh, things like the family. I guess that was maybe two weeks ago. Uh, but what are you going to talk about this week? Well, the last couple of weeks, we've been focusing on the picture that God gives us of the church in the context of it. we're like a body. The body of Christ is referenced in multiple places, uh, Ephesians 4, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. And in each of those passages that the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes about, he talks about, uses the body to picture as a picture of unity. We, we need to work together in order to get anything done. Obviously, uh, uh, legs that aren't working with the hands or eyes that aren't working with the hands or the feet are effectively crippled. So unity, but be, like the body, there's also diversity where we're just different. We, we function different. We see or sense different. Uh, and the importance of communicating. Uh, and then last week we focus, focused on the importance of maturity. The, 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 the fundamental differences between us, as is true in a relationship between anybody, husband and wife, children, causes us or, or um, encourages us to work together. And of course, it requires maturity to work together. So we focused on maturity yesterday, and one of the purposes of maturity is that we can be stable, that we can develop a level of stability so that we're not tossed around. Ephesians talks about uh, God gives pastors and evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the perfecting, for the uh, developing, for the, uh, literally the word means equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying building of the body of Christ. Uh, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. In other words, a mature body, uh, individual church as a functioning outreach representing Jesus Christ. The very next verse says, but so we get to the point that we're no more like children who are tossed about uh, and carried about with every wind of doctrine and sleight of hand whereby cunning men lie in wait to deceive us. Uh, so... I think most people would recognize outside of the church, even through our, well, the last couple of years, that, that there is a massive amount of misinformation. Uh, we, people have to make decisions about investments, about purchases, because of uh, lots of reasons. Our economy is, is hurting right now, the war in uh, uh, Ukraine, the pressure in China, the anxieties of COVID have just become, a, have brought to, to the surface what has always existed. And that's the fact that the God of this world, Satan, is a master manipulator. And he uses misinformation in order to accomplish that. Well, if we can understand that in our society, it also affects us in the church because Satan's goal is to try to use misinformation uh, to in order to motivate us to make choices uh, and choices particularly that would put us in in his under his influence move us away think about some a stability as in some something that's solid something that has a good foundation of understanding for instance right or wrong our society used to have a uh, a fairly solid concept of evil. We no, no longer have any concept of evil. Uh, we've moved the definition. We uh, even something as simple as right or wrong, whether it's gender issues or or sin issues, what constitute a sin. In so many ways, our society's standards of what is acceptable has been completely separated from its foundation. And I believe that I believe that happened in large measure in the in the 50s and 60s as as a nation we decided in our in the education of our children we're not going to talk about god so for 70 years almost people have grown up 60 70 years unless they found out about god through another means our the public education of america has removed right or wrong mm -hmm. uh, and like the book of judges which we've discussed often there's a cycle that takes place and 
uh, Judges is uh, twice it's written in Judges. There was no king, no authority in the land, so people did what they wanted. Every man did that which was right in their own eyes. And of course, that was Satan's first temptation. Mm -hmm. Defy God, you won't die, you'll be like God, you can make your own rules, you can know or determine your own good or evil. And that, that's the first words we heard out of Satan's mouth in Genesis 3, and he's still here today causing us or, or trying to, through deception, through delusion, through manipulation, through seduction, trying to get the body of Christ or individual members of the body of Christ, individual believers, to move away from the, from the foundation of God's truth, and that causes us to become very unstable. Yeah, and of course, uh, throughout the entire existence of humanity, there's always been uh, Satan trying to cause confusion where he'll start maybe causing different religions to sprout up and things like that, uh, and muddy the water so that people can't see clearly. But then recently we've gotten to a kind of a point where, I mean, maybe they've had it throughout other times in history, but a time of relativism where we think that truth isn't true it's just you have your own truth it's it's a very it's really muddied the water even more and it makes sense why like transgender movements uh would spring up in this lifetime because with this idea of there's no such thing as objectional truth truth is relative to the individual you decide your own truth uh, more of a humana not humanitarian what's the what's the word humanistic humanistic yeah humanitarian is not the same more of a humanistic mentality of where we decide right from wrong even though there's no reason we have for believing that we can decide what's right what's wrong it's just this idea of that's what we want uh, i talked to someone in the comments section recently and i mean i don't think the person was uh, being rude or anything like that and i tried not to be rude to him uh, but he was just talking about the Old Testament, for example, and he said uh, that, you know, he, it, the topic was concerning homosexuality. And he says, I don't think the Old Testament is true, like it's from God. And I believe that the Old Testament was just, and he came up with some theory to fit his, his preconceived idea about the Old Testament. Uh, so we kind of got into a little bit of a discussion of, you know, why don't you believe the Old Testament is true? Is it because you have some logical reason? Or is it just you don't want it to be true kind of thing? Because a lot of people, um, and he replied, I haven't read his reply yet, or I read part of it, but not all of it. The, the problem is a lot of people, they try to pick and choose out of the Bible what they want to be true. So if they don't like the concept of hell, then by golly, hell's not there no more, right? But it doesn't change the fact that hell exists. If it does exist, then it doesn't matter if they believe in it or not. It's still a place where some people are going, unfortunately. Uh, so... A lot of times we're taught it's the most loving thing you can do is let people live in their fantasy, right? Let people live their own truth. But in reality, when we see someone driving off of a cliff, the most loving thing you can do is confront their truth, if you will. Confront them and say, hey, I know you think that gravity doesn't exist, but it does, and there's going to be repercussions. And if they choose to continue to drive off the cliff, um, metaphorically, obviously, we, we don't really want people to drive off cliffs. Uh, that's up to them. But our job, of course, is to be loving towards others, and sometimes that involves confronting them with the truth. It's interesting, the very next verse, and of course, using, since Ephesians is one of the four primary ch uh, chapters in the Bible that address the church as a body. There are many other references, but those are four chapters that explain it in a little bit more detail. Right after talking about not being children and not being deceived, the very next verse is, but speaking the truth in love, we can grow up. And if there's not, if we don't have our roots in something that is stable, uh, what well, Jesus told the story in Matthew 7, closed the Sermon on the Mount with the wise man, the foolish man, the wise man's built his life, his, his, his uh, allegorically his house on a rock so that when circumstances changed, when the storms came, when the winds blew, when the rains came and the floods came, the, the house was still stable because it had a solid foundation, but the foolish man builds his house on the sand. And Jesus was, so when those circumstances change, the, the, the sand shifts and the house is in jeopardy. And Jesus was very clear. The foundation I'm talking about is the, the words, he, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. 
is like the wise man. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not is like the foolish man. So what Jesus is saying is, I am truth. And if you build your life on truth, truth doesn't change. Storms will come. Winds will come. Society will change. Circumstances will change. But truth doesn't change. So if our lives are built on biblical truth, even though we're in a world and in a society that is undergoing incredibly rapid changes, we, our faith won't fall. Uh, it will be assaulted. The, the house that was built on the storm, uh, on the foundation of the rock, still went through the storm. The flood still came, but the house wasn't affected, wasn't destroyed because it was stable. It was built on a non-movable foundation. Mm -hmm. The house and the life that is not built on solid truth, built on societal values, built on what I identify with today, built on my logic, built on some common or current philosophy. Those are all going to be eroded with the challenges of life, with time, and certainly with the transition to an, into eternity. Well, even thinking about science, we're often told, just follow the science, but the science is constantly changing, kind of like that sand. It may seem firm as your house is on it, but once the water comes and the tides change, uh, you're gonna notice science shifting with the tide and before you know it, the, the thing you were, your foundation was on starts to crumble. The concept of uh, evolution, for example, I think a lot of people put way too much trust in evolution. It has lots of flaws in it. Uh, but it's just this idea that Charles Darwin came up with a theory, and he was basing it on information he had. Uh, and I could say that, yeah, there's some intellect, intellect to his theory, but everyone just they just jumped on this theory and said, yes, this is what we're going to put our faith in completely on this. There is no God, right? Evolution disproves him, which it doesn't. Uh, so even if evolution, the theory of evolution is true, it doesn't disprove God. Uh, but everyone just jumped on this thing and said, this is, this is the place where we're going to put, take our stand. But it's on shifting sand. And I think more and more people, more and more scientists, as they see problems with the evolutionary theory, a lot of more people are starting to say, you know what, maybe we need to find alternative theories to this. You know, there's a principle in Scripture found in, well, woven throughout Scripture, but uh, articulated specifically in First Timothy 6, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they erred from the faith. The whole concept of Satan being the master manipulator and he trying to seduce us. Sin by its nature means to move away from the purpose for which we were created. Uh, the word sin is uh, hamatia or hamatano. Hamatano is the root word hamatia. Hamatano means to miss the mark and so forfeit the prize. Hamatia means to offend, to trespass. But both have in common is we were created for a mark, for a goal, for a purpose. And sin is anything that pulls us away from that purpose. So sin, whether it's moral sin or sexual sin or, or relational sin, it, it mars, it, it defies, if not defeats, the purpose for what we're doing. For instance, uh, Paul said, every man, uh, every sin is outside of the body, but he that committeth adultery with a woman sins against his own body. And the idea of sin there is, God created one man for one woman in a committed relationship and the sexual aspect of that relationship. That's the purpose of sex, to bind people together and to accomplish God's purposes. When I take that purpose and I use it for just the satisfaction of my temporary lust, I am sinning because I'm missing the whole point of that relationship. So Paul says, when I do that, I'm sinning against my, myself. The Bible often uses Satan in the context, alludes to Satan as a tempter. In 1 John 5 said, little children, we are of God, but we know that the whole world lies in wickedness. And, and the Greek word there is pone ross, it means diseased. The idea is Satan wants to infiltrate our mind with his deceptions or his delusions, appeal to our flesh with his seductions and try to move us away from God. So the context of stability, maturity should produce stability, is we know what we believe and we stand and that belief, we know what that belief is based on. 
Uh, so if we have a good foundation, as Jesus described, when, we're, when other people with other philosophies, whether it's Darwinism or, or the sexual revolution or some level of New Age enlightenment, we're not going to be so easily swayed. And uh, this is huge, I think, because our society, the Bible, 2,000 years ago, Paul revealed, or God, through Paul, through the Apostle John, God's Spirit revealed to us, we're in a world that's under the influence of a liar. The thief, Jesus said, comes to steal and kill and destroy. The thief blinds our minds. And, and he's used, described in many ways, a thief, of course, a, a lion in 1 Peter 5, a snake, a serpent in Genesis and in and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But the context of the serpent is he's trying to seduce us, just like he seduced Eve. He's trying to seduce us to disobey God, to move away from a foundation that's built on truth. Uh, so in our society today, truth is relevant. Mm -hmm. if, if you mentioned believe the science, and we talk about this often, it is, it is outrageous, it is absurd in the extreme that the same people who say believe the science don't believe the science if it, if it interferes with their philosophical freedom. Mm -hmm. I may feel like a girl, but every cell in my body screams, you're a boy, you're, that's the science. How I feel isn't science. Mm -hmm. And then they're trying to rewrite science. And then of course, uh, it produces confusion. And the Bible tells us pretty clearly, God is not the author of confusion. He's a God of order. Satan is a God of confusion. Yeah, and when it comes to following the science, I mean, anyway, we got into this most recently with the, the pandemic and the misinformation and then Facebook and all these other Twitter and all these other places, they were trying to crack down on misinformation. And it became quite the slippery slope because, first off, relativism, though it's not, there is some truth to relativism and the idea that people have different opinions, different preferences. It doesn't make their preferences objective, it just makes them their preferences. Uh, but when we look at the same information, we sometimes come to different conclusions. And scientists, all scientists do this, they look at the same information, the same data, and come to different conclusions. So when Facebook and Twitter and all these different places started censoring information, what they were doing was censoring someone's interpretation while promoting another person's interpretation. It wasn't following the science, you were just following someone's interpretation of the science. So a lot of times Christians get a lot of kickback saying, you don't, you don't follow the science or whatever it might be, but I might say, well, I don't follow the interpretation of the person you're following. Uh, but anyone who's ever done any above high school intellectual uh, studies would know that people come to different conclusions. We, you and I, we study the Bible. Look up any commentary, find one commentary, find another. You can come, you're going to find that they view things differently, even though they're looking at the exact same information. So it's not that we're against following the data. It's more we're against following uh, someone's random interpretation, which may change later on. And often, I'm going back to that comment in that verse about the love of money, many, much science, most science is funded by somebody with an agenda. So if global warming, for instance, how inconsistent, first it was global war first we were going to freeze, and then 15 years later, oh no, it's global warming. We're, we're melting the ice caps and, and there's going to be massive flooding. Which is a pretty drastic difference. In the yes, I, I, they're opposite and they're yeah. from the same scientist. And now they're so inconsistent that they just call it, oh, it, global climate change. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the absurdity, but why do these PhDs and these scientists, why do we hear so much about one side? Because they're funded. You mentioned the, the, the global pandemic. People made billions of dollars, companies made billions of dollars on a certain narrative. And when medical qualified scientists and microbiologists and doctors and talked, what, tried to give a, another perspective of silence, they were fired or they were silenced. And you do a little research and you realize that these people their livelihood, many of them are dependent on grants from the government. So if they take a position that contradicts or counter uh, acts 
what a particular philosophical position is, then they're going to lose their funding. In many cases, for scientists particularly, lose their, their reputation, possibly lose their job. So, so much of the misinformation can be tied to money. Mm -hmm. the, the, the plant pandemic, certainly, uh, you follow the money. Uh, in almost politics, you follow the money. Mm -hmm. And in some media, you follow the money. Uh, so the principle, God says, the love of money is the root of all evil, which once you go down that road, you, you end up piercing your through with, yourself through with many sorrows. Um, and you get caught up in the current mm -hmm. of, the, of society's values. Well, even, even people who may be non-corrupted by money, for example, sometimes there's genuine people who are just misguided by their own presuppositions, what they presuppose to be true. So, for example, let's say someone presupposes that there's no God, they're an atheist. Well, then they are asked the question, well, then how does life exist? They say, well, it must have been some other way. Well, how did they come to that conclusion? Based on their presupposition, they believe God doesn't exist, so God couldn't have created the earth and life and stuff like that. So they're already being biased based on their presupposition. So they say, it couldn't have been God, so what's an alternative to God? So they say, well, evolution, which I don't think is an alternative to God, right? It, you still need God in the situation. But they say, well, evolution... Uh, so I'll go ahead and find, I'll go ahead and research data through that presupposition that God doesn't exist, must be through evolution. So when they're trying to find the age of a rock, for example, there's something called radioactive isotope dating. It's hugely based on assumptions. Uh, it's the idea of there's parent elements and there's daughter elements. Uh, after a half-life, let's say carbon's half-life or whatever, uh, they go from parent elements, half of them go turn into daughter elements. So then they look at a rock, they see how many daughter elements there are compared to the parent elements, and they say, oh, this must be how old the earth is. But how do you know there weren't daughter elements there already? Like, how do you know the different things weren't already there? You're just assuming, and then, of course, with half-lives, they, they can be thousands of years, which no one's really been able to observe and stuff like that. But they base it on a presupposition, and if something doesn't fit their presupposition, they change it to where, where it does. So if they see a rock and they say, hey, this is five million years old, and they say, I found a Coke can in that rock. And they're like, oh, <laughs> right, they gotta change it. It's completely based on presuppositions, what they assume to be true, they interpret the data through that biasness. So it's, it's a really difficult for Christians right now, especially when it comes to science, because we went through that scientific revolution, if you will, where so many scientists were uh, atheists and they started teaching the students, right, God was taken out of school, and they started teaching the students uh, atheistic evolution in which people grew up being taught this, they went to university being taught this, and now they're the scientists and most of them would probably be atheists themselves, and now they're the ones producing all the science, all the interpretations of the data. So we're hearing the interpretations of a biased atheist uh, about how the earth came into being, how the universe came into being, how life came into being. And we're thinking, you know what, I don't buy that. And they said, you're, you're just dumb, right? You don't believe the science. Well, I don't believe your biasness. Uh, but there's other scientists, creationists, who do believe in God. But they and, don't have the funding, and they don't have the platform, they don't have the media. Or the majority right now. It's absolutely. And it really comes back down to how we started the conversation. First John 5 says the whole world lies in wickedness. Uh, and the whole world is diseased with deceit, and we are in this world. And the currents, whether it's the currents of science or the currents of sexuality or the currents of philosophy or the currents of political agendas, they're constantly shifting. And as the people of God, we will feel that current. But if, our, if we're not stable, if we're not mature in our faith and develop roots, Jesus talked about the important, what, what happened to the seed that didn't, uh, in the parable in Matthew 13, the sow and the seed, the seed that didn't get deep roots. Mm -hmm. Now it's talking about botany there and not architecture, but the same principle is true. It, it grew quickly, but, but when, when the period of drought came, it withered because it didn't have depth in themselves. So part of the process of maturing in our faith is recognizing the importance of building our lives on the foundation of God's truth, not the shifting sands of cultural science uh, or, or uh, philosophy 
because they have shifted drastically in my lifetime. Science has shifted. And, the same, and Paul talked in 1 Timothy chapter 4, for the Spirit, the Spirit of God speaketh expressly that in the latter days many shall depart from the faith. They're going to move off of a, a foundation of truth. And they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They will speak lies in hypocrisies. Their conscience will be seared with a hot iron. If, if there's two verses in the Bible that describes modern America, those are them. We're hypocrites. Our scientists are hypocrites. Anyone that took high school or even grade school biology over the last 200 years, everything they were taught is now, but that's not true. It's not the XY or uh, XXG, it's not biology isn't biology, it's, it's philosophy is biology. If you feel like a girl, then you're a girl. How absurd is that? How hypocritical is that? Yeah, two to, plus two is racist now. Or yeah, to think that in the last 10 years, this movement, which, which defies reason, defies science, defi and I, by, by this movement, I just don't mean the gender movement. Yeah. I mean the whole concept of science. We, we for, for 150 years, we handle pandemics the same way, except now. Mm -hmm. Now we know better, and how did that work out? And, and to, to believe that, that everything has changed, we know so much more now than we did 10 years ago, when we can objectively look back and say, that is ridiculous. And yet it is swallowed and digested and absorbed and infiltrating and infecting the minds of billions of people in our world. And as Christians who don't, for lack of a better term, drink the Kool-Aid of science, which the same book, by the way, Timothy says, Paul told Timothy 2000 years ago, beware of science, which is falsely so-called. If we build our lives on the truth of God and not on the shifting sands of science or philosophy, we're going to be targets. Mm -hmm. We're going to be called the homophobes or the xenophobes or the bigoted or whatever it is. So it's important that we take some time to look and understand what foundation is our life being built on. Because if I build it on two foundations that aren't the same, and that will react and respond differently to pressure, then I'm still going to have it. Ephesians chapter 4. Had a beautiful service yesterday, uh, Liz's, uh, Liz Berg's memorial service. It happened to be on there. Was it the 67th anniversary? Is that right? 67th anniversary with Glenn. Of course, the family's known a lot of separation and death this last year, but uh, at least Elizabeth and Glenn are celebrating their 67th anniversary in heaven this weekend. Pray for the family as they travel home and others that, of course, be traveling on this holiday weekend. Pictures of the people of God, recognizing through God's eyes, seeing through God's eyes, seeing ourselves, seeing the world around us. The word church, and we're focusing on particularly how God sees his people. The church is not a building. It's never been a, about being a building. The word church doesn't mean building. It's a called out assembly of people who belong to the Lord. And God gives us many different illustrations in scripture, sometimes in the form of a parable, sometimes in the form of a picture. We sometimes use these illustrations without even consciously thinking about what they mean. The Lord is my shepherd or our father, for instance, or brother or sister, when we refer to somebody else as a part of God's family. We've looked at these pictures over these, well, really the last number of months. Many of the pictures are precious. Remind us how valuable we are to God, how God sees us. The parables, two parables in Matthew 13 about the kingdom of heaven is like a buried treasure. Ma uh, Malachi chapter 3, in that day when, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before the Lord for them that thought upon him and feared his name. And God speaks in verse 17, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, and that day when I make up my jewels. God sees you and I far differently than we see each other when we see ourselves. God sees, when he sees you and I, he sees value. He sees something 
precious. We've talked about some progressive pictures, and by progressive, I mean the, I, they have the concept of growth. The Lord is my shepherd, which means I'm a lamb, and I, God wants me to grow into a sheep and develop by following him. Isaiah 64, another picture. Now, O Lord, thou art the potter, we are the clay, you're our father. You're shaping us. You're trying to help us to grow. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourself. It's the gift of God. It's not of works that any man should boast, but we are his workmanship. We are his poem and we are his masterpiece. He's trying to develop us into something of great value. And most recently, we've shifted our focus to very personal pictures. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3 talks about being part of God's family, a very personal relationship. Romans chapter 8 confirms this. If any man have not the Spirit of God, he's not God's. But if we have the, if we've trusted Christ as a Savior, we're heirs of God and joint heirs of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5. Even a more personal picture describes the church as the bride of Christ. And Revelation chapter 19 picks up on that theme as well. In the last couple of weeks, we've been focusing on more practical pictures. And I don't mean the others aren't practical, but the focus on, for instance, you're the body of Christ, is to try to help us to realize we're here to accomplish something for God's glory. Like a body has to learn to work together in order to accomplish anything, so the people of God have to learn to grow and to coordinate and to work together. This picture of God looking at us as a body is found in three major passages of Scripture, and they have the same thing. In 1 Corinthians, Romans, chapter Ephesians, God starts by talking about he's designed a unity. The body is supposed to become one and to accomplish God's purpose. So Satan, of course, seeks to destroy the unity in the church. Anyone ever see that at work? Every one of these passages also focuses on the distinction of the body. We're simply different. Individual parts of the body are different. And diversity, and it's, it's sad that sometimes Satan is able to use the, the very things that God use, wants to draw us together and make us more dependent on one another, our differences, to divide us. And then another common theme is all of these passages, God says we need to grow up. We need to learn to value each other and, and to grow so that we're an effective part of the body of Christ. But see, last week we talked on about diversity and, and mature, or two weeks ago diversity, last week maturity. But see, maturity is there to help us produce some ability. Maturity produces ministry. Ephesians chapter 4, pick up reading with me if you will. You want my job description? It's right here in part. God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers for the perfecting, for the developing, for the uh, adjusting of the, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, a mature person under the stature of the fullness of Christ. So maturity should produce ability by that practical ministry. You have some effective function that makes a difference in the lives of people and for the kingdom of God. And the next verse here says that we no more, be no more children tossed to and fro. So maturity should produce ministry as well as stability. So we're going to be focusing on stability today. How, why it's important that we know what we believe and that we believe what we know. God's Word is intimately practical. <sighs> there are so many misconceptions about God and His ways in this world. There are millions of people, not nearly as many as there have been in previous generations. There's over 350,000 churches in America of various sizes. The average church is about 70, by the way, 70 people. Uh, and people gather every Sunday to sit and listen to someone talk about God, at least hopefully talk about God. And they think that's church. That is not church. Church is a body, and church is the people. They, we come to a place that we call church, and we study God's Word, at least in some churches, but see, God doesn't call us together to study his word. That's not what God's word is written for. It's not written to be read, though the harsh reality is many people in, sitting in churches have never read the word of God in any real way. It's not really written just to be discussed, though that's something we do in our small groups and our Sunday school classes and during our evening services that they're designed so there's discussion. And I prefer that. And God's word is not written even to be studied. Why did God give us his word? To be obeyed. 
We meet, we discuss, we study, but that's not the goal. The goal is so we can get our heads and get our hearts around it and begin to practice and do what God has called us to do. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, The children of Israel knew the word of God, but it used Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments, and his face glowed, and he had to put a veil over his face. And God says, even to this day when, when Moses, the Old Testament, is preached, there's a veil over the hearts of the people of Israel. They don't get it. They study it, they memorize it, they know it, but they don't get it. So he, Paul uses that to say in, to us, but we, God's people, with an open face, take the veil off, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, the Word of God, it changes us. Romans chapter 12, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Same word, changed in 2 Corinthians 3.18 and transformed in Romans 12 is the same word in the original language, metamorphoo. You know it as metamorphosis. God wants to take those of us that have opened our hearts up to Christ, put our faith in him. God seals that deal with his Holy Spirit, and he wants to begin to change us from the inside out. So if we don't obey the word of God, we may grow very intelligent about what God says, how God feels, but if we don't obey the Word of God, it produces a dangerous form of deception. As a pastor for 35 years and a counselor for most of those years, I have learned one thing very well. We have an incredible ability to deceive ourselves. Another word is rationalize. We rationalize what's wrong. I'm not that person. I'm not that. I'm not that. Because we judge others by what they do. We judge ourselves by what we would like to do under the perfect circumstances. James puts it this way. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if you're a hearer without a doer, you're in the process of deceiving yourself. And it also produces a type of spiritual death. As the body without the spirit, in the next chapter in James, the body without the spirit is dead. It's still a body, but it can't do anything. So faith without works is dead also. We learn about God, but we don't do anything. We're not, we're not quickened. We're not inspired. We're not encouraged. You know what the word enthusiasm means, by the way? The word enthusiasm? And means in, and thuo comes from theo, God. It means God's in you. God is in you. We look at people at a Chiefs game. God's in them. No, not necessarily. <laughs> but they act like they're excited about something. You come to church and... But the whole idea is because God's in you, you're not dead. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2, a couple of chapters before what we just read, you used to be dead spiritually. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. But God made you alive spiritually. We looked at this last week. Ephesians, I love Ephesians because it is such a practical book. The first half of Ephesians is teaching important truth who we are, who God is, who Christ is, what he did for us. In, in chapter 1, we're called by grace to become a part of his family. Chapter 2, we've been raised from spiritual death to walk in newness of life. Chapter, end of chapter 2, it doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what ethnic background you come from. In the early church, it was the Jews and the Gentiles. It was the Jewish people who thought God loved them more than the Goyim, everybody else. And, and somehow, they were having trouble getting along. Go figure. But in Christ, God says, there's no more Jew or Gentile. There's no more slave or free. There's no more rich or poor. There's no more man and woman. And that is not gender confusion. That is simply, God loves everybody. God loves everybody. We're reconciled to God. And because we're reconciled to God, we can be reconciled to each other. Hear me carefully. You forget everything else I say. Hear this. You cannot be rightly related to other people if you're wrongly related to God. And then chapter 3, the mystery of God working in us. Chapter 3 closes, I, that, that I'm, I'm praying that God would open your eyes, that you'd understand the riches of the inheritance that we have. And then chapter 4, because we've been called by grace, walk worthy of such a responsibility in a relationship. Because we've been raised from the spiritual dead, 
Walk in purity. Clean up your life. Take off the grave clothes. Begin to act and reflect the reality that God's Holy Spirit is living in you. Because we're reconciled to God, and he's made it possible to be reconciled to people that are not like us and don't think like us, learn to walk in harmony. How many of you like music? You just like music. How many of you like harmony? My last church is in North Carolina. I was not really a Southern Gospel fan until I went to North Carolina and uh, listened to some of that old Southern Gospel four-part harmony. And man, I developed a taste for it. It's beautiful. God says, you're my song. You're not all the same note. Let's try to be in the same key. <laughs> so that what, what people see when they see my church at work is they see people who are working together, different people who can work together. And because we have God's power, we can walk in victory, even though Ephesians 6 says there's the devil and our battle is against spiritual principalities and powers in high places. So we're in chapter 4, in the middle of that, the chapter that transitions from what we know to what God expects us to do. Churches like body need to develop to become mature. We looked at this last week, for the perfecting of the saints so they can accomplish God's purpose and in doing so build one another up. The goal, we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature person. From telos, which means we achieve the goal or the purpose. Telios, mature, complete, implies that we're working towards some goal. Every parent who has a child, they have a goal for that child and have that child grow up. Not just physically, of course, but we want to develop their mind. We want to develop their spirit. We want to develop their attitudes. And to some degree, we all probably have similar goals. We want them to be positive, functioning members of a society. God's goal is this. It's God, Philippians chapter 2, it's God that works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Therefore, do all things without murmuring and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless as sons and daughters of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom God wants us to shine his lights, holding forth the word of life. God is our Father, has goals for us, and that goal is he wants us to achieve his purposes, which is to represent him in a world that doesn't know him. That a world, in a world that has judged God wrongly because God's people are not representing him rightly. Under the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. And then the very next verse, as we grow up, we have to grow deep. What has to come first, really? Roots or fruits? And what happens if the roots cannot support the fruits when the storms come. That we henceforth be no more children, immature, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to dis... I, I keep remembering it's hard for the people who are trying to watch this online. I'm a wanderer. Hi, my name is Keith, and I'm a wanderer. <laughs> so... We got so much going on in this age, and, and I, you know, 50 years ago, this may have been hard to, for, for mo the average person to recognize. It's not that hard today. There are so many factors and forces trying to manipulate us, trying to deceive us, trying to get us to move in one direction or another. Regardless of your political spectrum, there is no question that the political spectrum has become, <sighs> wow, <laughs> I'll just say Wow. Satan is called the God of this world by God. But Satan is a little God of this world. He is the author of misinformation. Genesis 1, we meet him for the first time, approaching Eve, somehow isolated from Adam. We don't know why. Maybe they had a, no, they didn't have a fight. They were perfect back then. She just drifted towards the one spot God said, stay away from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan said, it's God really said you shouldn't eat of that. And she answered, yes, he did, and he did. Then Satan challenged, God, you will not die. God knows the day you defy him and eat that fruit, you'll be like God. You can determine your own good or evil. That's what's been happening in our country in a very active way in the last 50 or 60 years. We kicked God out of our education system. We removed God from the awareness of the average American person. And what, was, what used to be evil is now good. 
What used to be wrong is now considered right. And if you don't accept that, you're wrong. Our whole society has become shifted because the father of misinformation. John 8, Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh it of himself because he is a liar and the father of it. But the problem is he has incredible influence. He's very good at it. First John chapter 2, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not working in his life. Because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world will pass away, and all of those lusts will pass away, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Second Corinthians 4.4 4 calls him the God of this world, and in his modus operandi... That's about the extent of my Latin. His mode of operating is through deceit. And he does this because he needs to blind our minds. The God of this world blinds the minds of those that don't believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. First John 5, 19, little children, we are of God, but we know the whole world lies in wickedness. This word wickedness literally means diseased. The world is diseased by evil. And six times that particular word is actually translated the wicked one. Not just wickedness, not disease, the diseased one. The one who's behind it, and of course, that's Satan. Unfortunately, he doesn't work alone. Not only does the Bible say one-third of the angels, which cannot be numbered, fell, followed him in their rebellion against God. So there's a whole host of unseen fallen angels working for him. Second Corinthians tells us there are deceitful workers who transform themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, that means Satan has ministers. Now, I, I don't know that I'm completely qualified to judge, but based on my research and what I run into when I talk to religious people, a lot of them are right behind pulpits this morning, misleading people. Because misled people mislead people. Jesus said even the religious leaders of his day were blind. They rejected him. He said, search the scriptures. You think in them you have eternal life, but they testify of me, but you won't come to me. But there are people following you. And Jesus said they are blind leading the blind. And when the blind lead the blind, they're both going to end up into a ditch. It's no great thing if his, Satan's ministers, be transformed into ministers of righteousness, which means they dis they. They act, and maybe even they convince themselves that they're representing God, but they're actually representing the master manipulator, Satan. Now, why would he misinform us? Why is he the master of deception? Because deception affects our direction. It affects our decisions, and our decisions affect our direction. Satan wants to move us. From what? Or more to the point, from who? He seeks to infiltrate our minds so he can influence our behavior. There's a scene in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus, for no apparent reason, walks, a, walks a, about 120 miles north, the northern tip of Israel. It's a place called Caesarea Philippi at, the, at, the, at Mount Hermon. It's where the Jordan River actually starts, and it's where there was a whole lot of temples. I shared those temples with you several weeks ago, pictures of them. And it's called the Seed of Satan. Uh, and Jesus said, who am I? And, and they acknowledged that he was the son of God. And Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on that truth. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then Jesus immediately began to say, now we're going to head south. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men. They're going to beat me and they're going to crucify me. And I'm going to rise again the third day. Peter grabbed Jesus, physically grabbed. No way, not so, Lord. That's not going to happen. Jesus turned around and gave us something very revealing. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, the interesting thing is, the previous sentence out of Peter's mouth is, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter said, blessed are thou, Peter, because God, my Father God, revealed that to you. You're speaking, you're thinking God's thoughts. God put that reality in your mind. The next thing out of Peter's mouth is, no way is that going to happen. Get thee behind me, Satan. What is Jesus telling us? One thing out of Peter's mouth had its origin with God. 
The next thing out of Peter's mouth had its origin with Satan. Do you think Peter understood the difference? Jesus made it a point of saying, that's from God, that's from Satan. Which tells me this, both God and Satan have some access to our minds. The Bible talks about fiery darts in Ephesians 6. Those darts can be thoughts that are put into our mind trying to get us to go in a certain direction, influence. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25 says this, be angry. Anger is not a sin. What we do with our anger can be very sinful. Be angry and don't sin. Anger is a, is a barometer that something's wrong. Be angry but don't sin. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, sin that's not dealt with can become wrath. Wrath that's not dealt with can become bitterness. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath or you will give place. Topaz, you will give a place in your heart, in your mind to Satan, and he will in, begin to influence your thoughts. We've all been down those angry rabbit holes, haven't we? You think about some wrong. Maybe it happened years ago, but you start thinking about it out, out of nowhere, and you start reliving that. What begins to happen to your soul? It could be a great day until that thought comes in your mind, and you see that person, or you remember that thing, and all of a sudden, it's, it's over. I mean, you're, you're depressed, you're discouraged, you're angry. That's what the devil does. So where is he trying to take us? Well, to do that, we need to recognize what we were made for. Remember, mature comes from a word that means to, to achieve the goal. Sin comes from a word that means to miss the goal, to miss the mark. So we were created, what's the goal? For his glory. How many of you were, went through catechism of some sort? Catechism. Westminster Catechism, I, was, I wasn't saved, but I joined the Presbyterian Church when I was 13 because there were pretty girls in the youth group, and they said I needed to be baptized. So I went through, jumped through their hoops, learned the shorter catechism, and some of you who come from the, the, the catechism background, what is the chief end of man? Anyone know that answer in the catechism? What is the chief end of man? Come on, blow out the cobwebs to glorify God and enjoy Him. I remember that, and that was 1972. The chief end of man, according to the catechism, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And that was based on a scriptural principle I shared a couple of weeks ago. There, we'll st when we stand before God, we will get it. It's not about me. Not about my happiness. That's what the world tells you. Be happy, you're not happy. You're not happy with your wife, find a new one. You're not happy with your husband, try to change him. If he won't change, dump him. Find somebody else you'll eventually not be happy with. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that means think differently. We were created for God's purposes, his pleasure. And we were created for our good. Folks, God doesn't need us. He created us because he loved us. We were created to accomplish that which is going to matter. Every human being has a desire in their heart to make a difference, to matter. And you were created by a, an omnipotent, all-powerful God, and you were created to make a difference. The world comes along and says, this is how you can make a difference. Get an education, get a job, don't worry about God, pursue your own goals. That's not the God of this world talking. We were created for his glory and for our good. Ephesians 2, we're his workmanship created for good works. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love God because God is trying to shape us. John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I am come that you might have life and abundant life. Proverbs 16, 11, thou wilt show me the path of life, the path that's going to achieve that goal you made me for. In your presence is fullness of joy. At, at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. That's what God created us for. So Satan comes along as the thief and tries to rob us of both. He robs us of the reality that it's not about us. He kind of convinces us it's about us. That's what he did with Eve. That's what he does with you and I. It's not about, don't worry about anybody else. You just take care of number one. Well, I would agree as long as you understand who number one is. Colossians 1 says, he is before all things and by him all things consist. And it is his will that in all things he should have the preeminence. Why? Because he's the only one that knows the future. Why wouldn't we follow him? He's the God of love. His very nature is love. Why wouldn't we trust him? But the God of this world says, ignore him. He doesn't care about you. You just care about yourself. How's that working out for you? 
how does a thief do this? <laughs> He's the ultimate seductor. James chapter 1, how many of you are fish, fishermen or fisherwomen? You like to fish. Anybody? Good for you. James chapter 1 uses the picture of an angler who chooses a lure. He knows what he's fishing for. He chooses a lure that's going to attract that fish's attention. Let no man say when they're tempted, they're tempted of God. God's not going to tempt you, but everyone is tempted when they are drawn away of their own lust. Tempted is the word parazo. It means you're going to be scrutinized. You're going to be tested. And what Satan does is try to draw you away. Draw you away from what? Draw you away from God. Draw you away from the purposes for which God created you. Draw you away from the people that God has brought into your life to help you. Drawn away of their own lust. Basically, it means something you set your heart on, something you want. That's what the word lust means. Epi means superimpose, which means somebody else is trying to superimpose their values in your life. That's what the God of this world does. He tries to superimpose his values. That's what this world does, try to superimpose their values on your desire. So your desire now becomes, th their desire becomes your desire. That's lust. Drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Enticed in the, in the language of the Bible means you're deluded and you're trapped. You got there because he lied to you. You believe the lies. You set your heart on something that cannot satisfy. So this, the, the master angler chooses the bait that he knows will attract us. He, tries, he uses that bait to draw us away from our relationship with God and with people who are going to help us encourage that relationship. And the, as the fish follows, eventually he bites what he thinks is going to satisfy him or her. And what does he find in the bait? A hook. Every man is drawn away, tempted when they're drawn away of their own lust, enticed, deceived, and trapped. Then when lust has conceived, you just bit down, baby. <laughs> it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished. Now, this word sin is harmatia. There's two words in the New Testament that are both translated sin, but they're almost identical. Just a little bit more Clarification. Harmatia means to offend. You've offended God. You've offended the purposes for which God made you. It comes from hamatarno, which means you've trespassed. You've moved into Satan's neighborhood. You're playing in Satan's backyard. You're trespassing in Satan's backyard, giving him a level of authority in your life. And this is a, a quote from the, uh, from the uh, Greek dictionary. You've, you've trespassed. You've missed the mark, which means you were on course. Satan got you off course. And because you're off course, unless you get back on course, you're going to miss the prize. See, it's not about, it's not about, it's not even about God in the sense that God has a plan for your life and in his presence is fullness of joy. He wants you to be eternally fulfilled. So he's given you his Holy Spirit if you were his child. And that Holy Spirit, he's given us his word. He's given us his church. We're supposed to help each other grow up and understand the devil's out there. And he uses all the things he can to pull us away from God. To miss the mark and therefore we will forfeit the prize. Sin when it's finished brings forth death. And then he wraps it up. So don't err. Don't roam. Don't drift. Don't get distracted by Satan's lies because he's a liar and the father of lies. And folks, this will only get worse. Have you noticed that there's more and more deception around today? Have you noticed that, wow, you read something, you want to believe it, so you act like it's true, you pass it on, and maybe someone challenges you and what you believed isn't true, and how do you handle that? How do you handle when you're confronted with something that someone else doesn't believe is true? Here's a very important question. If what you believe were wrong, would you really be open to learning that? And if not, why not? There's a world going to hell because they believe lies. And God has given us the, chal the challenge of sharing the truth with them. But Jesus in John 3, the same verse that says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, said this is, the, this is the condemnation, this is the problem. Light is coming to the world. Truth is coming to the world. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, This know also in the last days, perilous, dangerous, difficult times will come. Evil men and seducers, liars, Disciples of Satan's deceit will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In other words, they, 
you know, the thing, of, the thing about lies, the more you tell yourself something, the more you believe it. Psychologically, our brains are like these Kansas dirt roads. After a little bit of a storm, the dirt gets soft and we make new grooves. But what happens when the Kansas sun comes out and the wind blows? What happens to those grooves? They become ruts. That's how our minds work. We think something deeply enough and go down that rut often enough, it becomes a mental pathway to the neurons in our brain, and we convince ourselves this is true. And have you ever tried to get out of one of those Kansas dirt road ruts? It gets a little rocky, doesn't it? So what do we end up doing? Find my rut. <laughs> as long as the rut's going my way, I'm good. Well, what happens when you try to get out of the rut's way? It's rough. That is a picture of what's going on in our mind, and that's a picture of what the devil is doing. Reinforcing lies and lies and lies and lies and lies until they become truth. Uh, believe the science. Do I need to say anything else? My body, my choice. Do I need to say anything else? deceiving and being deceived. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12, a picture of the last days, the great dragon, Satan is identified in Revelation 12, was thrown down. The serpent of old, which is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And then an angel cries out, woe to the inhabitants of the world, of the earth, because the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he hath but a short time. This matter of deception, we have seen it. We have seen it certainly in the last 10, there has never been a 10-year period in my life, and I'm an old man, that there has been more flagrant lies fed to the American people. And if you were paying attention 10 years ago, and you look at where we've gone as a country and our values, there have been so much misinformation. And the people spreading the misinformation, how do they respond to people who don't want to agree with them? What happened to freedom of speech? Second Thessalonians says, in the last days, Satan's going to find human beings to partner with, particularly what the Bible describes as the Antichrist who becomes the beast. Even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. If you, don't, if you don't get a hold of truth now, our world is only going to get darker. It's only going to get darker. And, and the dim switch is getting turned down by huge notches now. And we're adapting and we're adjusting. Again, this is not about politics, but we look a whole lot more like communist China now than we did three years ago. There's a dimmer switch on the minds of our world and it's Satan who has his hands in it, and it's only going to get darker. So you need to respond to truth while you can still see it. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, from truth, giving heed to, notice this, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Seared. What does seared do to the? What does seared do to the skin? You put a hot iron on your skin. What's your natural response? Yike! You leave it there long enough, either by choice or by force. What happens? You'll go through excruciating pain for a while. But what will eventually happen? You'll destroy the nerves in that hand. The disease of leprosy is a disease because it deadens the nerves, and people don't even know when they're hurting themselves because they can't. They can't feel. That's the concept, seared, cauterized with a hot iron. So by way of conclusion, just a quick review. We talked about Russian, well, we didn't, but the world has been filled with Russian collusion for three years. Now we're getting the truth out, and it's completely different than what we were fed for three years. Let me tell you the great collusion. It has nothing to do with Trump or Biden or Republicans or Democrats. The great collusion is Satan is colluding with this world, as the father of lies feeding us misinformation, he has lots of ministers or disciples of deceit. He does this because he's trying to affect our direction. He affects our direction by infiltrating our mind. And so we, when we see things, we process them through our mind. Well, what if our mind is wrong? What do you think about when you hear the term brainwashing? Is it a positive or a negative thing? Isn't that interesting? Normally, washing is good, right? 
And it implies something's contaminated and it's affecting you, so you want to get it off of your hands. Chloe was over and, and John was moving. My son John was moving. The kids were helping him move. I got back from yesterday and we had the, the, Chloe, uh, Daniel and, and Lily were watching my little, what, three-year-old grandson. And he's out playing in the dirt and playing with them. We got some new guineas and, and just being a boy. And now we got, I brought pizza home. And, and Chloe said, let's go wash your hands. And, and Christian, they're fine. <laughs> they're fine. Well, you know, the problem is he didn't want to wash his hands because he didn't see the dirt, but the dirt is all in there, guys. The dirt of deception is in our minds. The reality is we need a, we need a genuine brainwashing. We need to wash away the filth. We need to identify truth and error and clean the error out. Satan uses seduction and misdirection to infiltrate our minds and our thinking. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, causing us to drift. The reality is, there's, I'm not here to identify all the cults, but you know who sits in the churches of most of the cults today? You know where they got those people? Fringe believers. People who once sat in churches that taught the Bible. They know enough about God to say, yeah, I believe in God. But they don't know enough about God to discern the difference between right and wrong. So they, people love on them and try, they do. Many of these cults are very attentive. They'll, they'll reach out to people who are being neglected. They'll love on them. They'll serve them. They'll do things. And they pull them in and they begin to teach them false doctrine because they don't recognize truth from error. God's solution, spiritual maturity that produces stability. So we can develop roots in the right truth so we could recognize the error. God's great solution, speaking the truth in love, we're able to grow up into him in all things. The problem by way of application, satanic deception. Believe not every spirit, try the spirits, whether they be of God, because there's false prophets out there. There's liars out there. There's liars in our politics. There's liars in our pulpits. There's liars in our families. There's liars among our friends. What's a false prophet? False prophet. Many false prophets. What's a false prophet? What's a prophet? The word prophet means inspired speaker. Inspired speaker. Who's inspiring them? Well, the Bible says there's true prophets or false prophets. What, what, what does a false prophet do? Misleads people. But what if he's misled? Does he know he's a false prophet? Does she know she's a false prophet? So you have a problem. You have a decision to make. You go to your friend and she tells you to do what you want to do. <laughs> Without any regard to what God has to say. Hear me carefully. That friend has just become a false prophet. They're telling you it's okay. God wants you happy. You're not happy where you are. Dump the bomb. Dump the whatever. I'm not going to go there. God wants you happy. That was the line of all of the false prophets. God wants you holy. God wants you to follow him because that alone will bring you genuine satisfaction. The promise, that's not divine. That's divine. <laughs> Sorry. So much for word check. First John 4, 1, be careful. Many false prophets are out there. First John 4, 4, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The devil's out there. He's a liar. He's good at it. But you have the Spirit of God inside of you who's greater than, than he is. The process, go deep. Chapter 5, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. We know his word. And his commandments not going to... Uh, class, what is the word commandment in the language of the New Testament? What does it really mean? If you were Greek, and, and I was reading this in, in Greek which is what it was written in, it's entole. What does entole mean? Authoritative. I, I guess I just don't repeat myself enough. <laughs> Authoritative prescription. God's word is what heals us. Remember, the whole world lies in wickedness, disease, God's commandments, my prescription. We don't look at it like that, do we? Oh, God's just trying to hurt us. He's trying to... Try to herd us. He's trying to heal us. This is the love of God. We keep his commandments. We value his. The word keep means to value. We treasure. We value his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. How do we overcome Satan and his delusion? Our faith. Pistis. Trust. From pitho. Our conviction. 
something we're sure of, something we are deeply embedded in. All Scripture, right? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Next verse, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, not flawless, complete, thoroughly furnished, equipped to all good works. This faith becomes a weapon, both defensive and offensive. Above all, chapter 6 talks about the, the world and the devil and the battle that's really going on. We think it's against people we disagree with. No, it's against spiritual forces at work trying to shape minds and hearts to prepare them for the last day. Above all, taking the shield of faith so you can quench the fiery darts of the wicked, so you can recognize when you hear something, wherever it comes from, it gets filtered through the shield of faith. What's faith made of? Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17 says, hearing by the Word of God. You take what you're hearing, it gets filtered through your knowledge of the Word of God, and you can say, that's not true. Doesn't matter who said it. That's not true. Take the shield of faith to quench those fiery darts so those lies don't get inside, and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. This is a foundational, formidable faith. Faith is the substance. Hypostasis is the word. It's the footing on which we build our lives. The foundation is Jesus Christ. But what keeps the foundation from shifting? The footing under the foundation. Faith is the footing. Literally, it means that which is under the evidence or conviction of the things that are not seen. It enables us to become discerning, to try the spirits, to recognize the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And the word error means deception that causes us to stray. Now, I want you to take your minds as we wrap this up. Jesus preached his first recorded sermon. We know it is a Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7 of the book of Matthew, early in his ministry. He closes this sermon with this. Strive to enter the straight gate. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life. Few will find it because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Waste is the word. Destruction. And many go there in. The very next thing he says, so beware of false prophets. Why? Because false prophets are going to try to direct you to which gate? <laughs> the wide one. They're going to say, hey, that, do what you like. Isn't that saying, be your own God. Make your own choices. You define what's right and wrong. It, 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 it's, if it's right for you, wonderful. It can't be wrong if it feels right, right? This is the false prophets, the broad gate. He says, beware. There's two gates. One will lead to eternal life and, and fulfillment. One will lead to destruction. Most will go this way. Why? Because the God of this world is very good at his job. And there's plenty of people to help him. So beware of those. Identify them. Many will be seen because in that day of judgment, many will say to me, but Lord, Lord, look at all I did. And he said, depart from me. I never knew you. And then he closes this. Whosoever therefore heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. First he says, he that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not is like a foolish man which built his house on the sands. Here's the point. Doesn't matter if you're in church or out of church. Doesn't matter if you read your Bible or doesn't read your Bible. The people he's talking about were listening to him. People he's talking about, many of them knew the Word of God, knew the Bible. He says, it's not what you hear. It's what you do with what you hear. He that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, we're all going to build our lives. We're all going to build something out of our lives. But Jesus said, you're like a foolish man who builds on the sand. Because the rain's going to come, the storm's going to come, the wind's going to blow, and the house is going to fall. And great will be the fall of it. But whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, both of them heard, both of them might have believed to some degree, but only one bothered to build, to apply those truths to their lives. I will luck in him unto a wise man that builds his house upon a rock. Here's my final word. <laughs> Storms are here. Perilous times are here. Deception is here. We are on the brink of global problems. You put China in its, what's going on there? You put Ukraine and Russia 
and the, you put over here in America all the economic problems, all the political deception, we're in a world of trouble. For the first time in 50 years, we're talking about nuclear war. We're in a mess, people. We're just in a mess. And if you think the Federal Reserve can tweak and fix this mess, you're just not. They can't. We're in a mess. Storms are here, and they're coming, and they're only going to get more intense. Do you have a foundation that can survive them? Do you have a foundation built in that which is true? So when that which is not true begins to batter against you, you don't move. This is what's true. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share today. Lord, your word tells us that part of my responsibility is to equip your people so they can grow up, grow in their knowledge of you, grow in their love for you, grow in their commitment to you. So through them, ministry to a, a confused world, to a hurting world, to people who are deceived, believing lies, that will eventually and perhaps even eternally affect them. And you tell us you don't want us to be like children that believe everything that's told, but to, to put our faith in your truth. So, Father, you know where each of us are. I know we have folks visiting from other parts of our state or even our country. You know, you know where we live. You know where we work. You know where we worship or if we worship. You know the, the storms that we're each dealing with. Some are physical, some are financial, some are relational. But Lord, they're here. I pray that you would motivate each of us to take a good, thorough, and honest assessment of what our lives are truly built on, what our faith is actually in. And if that faith has been misplaced in a person or in a religion or in some kind of moral or or spiritual effort instead of in the reality that Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. Then you would help us to recognize that and commit whatever we built out of our lives to you so that you can remodel it into that which is not only beautiful for you, practical for us and others, but that which will survive the storms that are raging around us. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Yes, Lord, your word indeed remains. Let all stand as we sing praises to God. You deserve all the glory.